Well, good morning again. Thank you for, for joining us and again online, for those of you who are with us as, as well. And uh, that audience keeps growing a, as well. I keep hearing from more people how throughout the country um, people are checking in with us. So just want to thank you for that. As you can see, we still have all these, these bikes up here. Uh, some of them got some mileage this week, not a whole lot. Uh, and I'll get into that in a little bit about why that is. But uh, how many of you have gotten out your bicycles in the past few weeks here for the first time in a long time? All right, three. Okay, I can see this as having a profound impact on your lives. Actually, I think there were more people at the first service who, who raised their hands on that one, and uh, it's, uh, it's always interesting. Well, I did what you said, Pastor, and I'm in the hospital because I fell. Well, I did as you said, Pastor, and now I'm worn out because I, I went three miles in my stationery. You know, anyway, whatever it is, dust it off, get it back out. But you know what? I think most importantly, um, what we're trying to do with this series is not to get you to ride bikes, though it would be very cool to have a Peloton, our own Peloton at the end, right? A group race. Would that be cool? How many of you would be interested in that if we did that? If we started here at the parking lot and we drove around it three times, would that be okay? Just trying to get more people here. All right. Well... Our series is called The Tour to Faith. That's what it's all about. It's about the journey of faith, the race of faith that we have in our lives. And if you haven't seen the La Tour de France, uh, that's, a, that's a worthwhile watch. It really is. You, you, know, you can tune into it and tune out, you know, videotape it and then go back over it. But it's very, very cool. 21 days of racing. 21 days in a row. I think I get one day off because it's over 23 days. They run about 100 miles a day, 2,200 miles, and they go up and around over mountains. I have a hard enough time with the mountains on Ronald Reagan, you know. But the mountains of the Alps and the Pyrenees, I can't even imagine that. But uh, 20 teams, about 200 of the world's strongest uh, cyclists participate in that. How many of you have ever participated in the Tour de France? See what I mean? Yes, I have no ambition to do so either, um, I'll tell you. So the question, though, is what could I possibly bring to the table in terms of cycling that would have any benefit for our lives? Well, let me just start this with you. I've, I've been riding a bike all my life. There were a few years I didn't, and now I'm back at it again. And I think riding a bicycle gives you a unique perspective to life. I mean, most of us, when we drive around in our insulated tubes of metal, you know, we don't really get to see life up close and personal, certainly not in the way you do from the seat of, of a bike. And what I've experienced over the years, especially just the past few years, um, well, some things have been revealed to me about me. And that's really what this series is all about. It's kind of a self-discovery process. And as I share some things, reveal some things to you that I've learned about me, my hope is that they might help you discover some things about yourself as well. Self-discovery, it's never painless, that's for sure, but it's always good. It's always, always good. In our first week, it was rookies and roadies, the cycling of discipling. And my self-discovery in that very first message was how much I need to learn and keep needing to learn, not only about the world of cycling, but the world of faith. Some people think, oh, you're a pastor, you've learned it all. Not even close. Not even close. It is a daily process. And so what we learned in that first message was, we all need a roadie in the world of cycling, and in the world of faith, we all need a disciple. Our saying here is, we make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, and even those who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, need a disciple. All right. Last week was road rash. That was a fun one. Pride before the fall, pride before the biff in cycling terms. My self-discovery there, um, because of the falls that I've had in my life, especially on the bike, are that, you know, sooner or later we're all going to fall. The positive way to look at it, though, is that God either causes or allows all things. Now, the reason that's positive is because God has use for those falls that happen in our life. And the first and foremost purpose of allowing us to fall is to cause us to be humble before him. Because that's when we are flat on our backs, when we have a tendency to look up and see God for who he is. And we say, thank you, God, for your grace and your love in Jesus Christ. So, falls, not a bad thing, and they happen. Well, today, the title of the message is Crosswalks, Finding That Balance Between Being Right and 
Dead Right. Now, I know it's kind of a strange title. Maybe they all are. But this one in particular came from a discussion that I had with a group of people. Some of you are here right now. In the worship center between services, it was about two months before we even started this series. And what happened was the group was talking, and I joined in, and they started me asking me about cycling, and so I was telling them about an experience I just had the day before on the Saturday before. And that was going through a crosswalk, the one on 1431 and Palmer. How many of you know where that is? 1431 Palmer or Reagan, depending on which side of 1431 you're on. That is a busy intersection. And I was on about mile 20 at the time. And I was a little bit tired. I'm coming up the hill, and the light was green, so I started going through it when it turned yellow. Well, you know, the yellow lights, at least in Texas, at least on 1431 and Palmer, they're not made for the speed of a bicycle from someone who's tired and maybe a little slow, all right? They're made more for cars that can go a lot faster. So the yellow light turned to red when I was about three-quarters of the way through the intersection. Now, wouldn't you think everybody would just stop? They would just wait patiently till I was through, not a chance, not a chance. I mean, I'm not kidding. I am almost through, and as soon as it turned red, I'll tell you what, there's a new way to measure the smallest amount of time. That is when a light turns green and when the Austin motorists get going, I tell you, because they were just out there. I mean, I had a screech to a halt, lay the bike down almost and came like that close from running into a car that had pulled out in front of me. And here's the weird thing. When they do that, they don't notice it right away. They just pull out, then they go, oh, I better stop, which is the wrong thing to do. Just keep going so I can get past you. Anyway, so so people are honking at me, and if I had a horn, I'd be honking at them because I am mad. I'm like, really, people? I mean, you uh, you know, Texas law says once you enter an intersection on the yellow, You're not going to get a ticket. It is legal to continue on through, just not on a bike, at least according to motorists. And so I was sharing this with the group, and I said, you know what? I was so mad. I was just thinking, all right, fine. You want to hit me? You go ahead and hit me, because I'll tell you what, I'm right. And somebody in that group yells out, yeah, you're right, all right, pastor, dead right. Thus, the title of the message today. And I'll tell you... um, what I learned there, how deep a problem I have personally with what I figure are injustices in life. It's deep, and it really concerns me. I'm working on it. I can't stand it when things are done unfairly to people. How many of you are with me? I mean, when things are done unjustly, I don't even like watching the news anymore to to see all the things, all the unfair things, at least in my mind, that that, that happen. One of the things is mentoring our our vicar, Stephen, here is, uh, you know, I talk to him about a lot of different things and share with him some personal stories, which he won't share with you because he's under a confidentiality agreement. But um, one of the things is we always talk about, careful what you pray for. Like, the, the last thing you want to pray for is patience because... (laughs) <laughs> you will be tested, all right? Because if you're praying for patience, that's how you get patience. Well, I was telling Stephen, I says, uh, you know, be careful what you preach on. Because it seems to me over my years in the ministry, every time I've preached on anything, God always gives me an illustration for the message, a real life illustration. I don't use books for illustrations anymore. I don't have to. He gives them to me in real life, and unfortunately, it usually has to do with me. And this week, as I was talking to God about the message, I did pray to him for some illustrations on injustice. So, some things I wanted to share with you today. How many of you experienced the storm uh, Sunday night, last Sunday night, a storm? All right. Anybody have anything bad happen because of the storm? Oh, you lost your TV? Yeah, yeah. What happened? All the furniture went in the pool. Everything went in the pool. All right. Anybody else? Anybody else want to share anything really bad that happened? Because that was nothing. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, I, no, no, really, I, it, it was loud. It kept a lot of people awake. I heard all this stuff. But um, what happened to us is, 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 is we woke up, and it was about, I don't know, 78 or so in the, in the house, and we found out later on in the morning that our air conditioning had been fried. Um, our compressor in the condenser, I've learned all this, uh, um, outside got fried because of a power surge. All right, so I, I'm sharing it with you, not because that's what bugs me. That's life. That happens. What I call injustices, though, are 
when, when people, either by what they do or don't do, cause hardship to someone else. Some of those instances. So I knew this was going to be really expensive. I don't know the last time you replaced your air conditioning, but it's not cheap. And so I first of all went to a home warranty that I had. When we bought our home in 2014, it was a model home of three years. So it was seven years old, but we bought it with a warranty in writing that said it'll be covered starting now with the full warranty on everything mechanical, whatever you have in your house. And so I thought that was pretty cool. So I called the, uh, the company that manufactured the compressor, and unfortunately, our builder had never registered that warranty um, with that company, so they wouldn't honor it. Wasn't that nice? All right. So I thought, that's okay. I got a backup because I have homeowner's insurance, right? Really good homeowner's insurance. We've had this, this company for 45 years <clears throat> until last week. Um, and, um, and, and, and though they cover damage to the air conditioning system, to the compressor, um, because of lightning, they don't cover damage um, from power surges, even if they're caused by lightning, all right? When I started to argue this, she said, sir, it says right in your policy, and I, there was really nothing I could. You know, I'll bet some of you right now are thinking to yourselves, I better talk to pastor after service because I can fix that, right? Are some of you there right now because you're thinking, you know what, I know how to get through that. I'm going to grab them, I'm going to pull them aside, and we're, we're going to fix this problem. And you know why I know you're thinking that? Because that's how I think. I think if there's an injustice, we're going to make this right, and I'm going to figure out how to do that. Well... <clears throat> Back to cycling. That's how I think about being in a crosswalk and having injustices happen. And the greatest injustice, I believe, in the life of a cyclist is going through a crosswalk when nobody's paying attention to you as a cyclist. Nobody's paying attention to the laws. It is the most dangerous place you can ride is through a crosswalk. I want to show you what I mean by this brief video taken by Kelly's dad, Stephen's father-in-law, he is quite a cyclist. He's the real deal. Um, I don't think he's in the Tour de France, but he could be, I think, if he wanted to be. He's leading a group of cyclists when this happens. Let's take a look at that. Green up. Whoa! Yeah. All right, so those of you who have experienced that... You see the light turns green. He's the leader. He says, green up. It's time to go. And what we couldn't hear at the end was when he said, oh, this is special. Um, but fortunately, he did a heads up himself and saw that the truck was going to run the red light. My most common route that I used to take uh, for, a, for a brief ride of about 13 miles was from home to church and then, and then back again. I still do this route, but not so much anymore because it is so dangerous. There are so many crosswalks I, I have to go through. And I'll tell you what, it's not, it's not that drivers are intentional about this, but some really just aren't paying attention. And some don't care. I mean, I will say that. I have had some people who have had yield signs or stop signs. Even yesterday, a policeman yelling at the person to stop so I could travel through, who refused to, who went right through that. And yet they look me right in the eye with this smug look like, <laughs> you're on a bike, try going. You know, that's kind of what it is. Like, I'm going to cut you off and see what you can do about it. And there's nothing, there's nothing you, you, you can do about it. And I'll tell you what, it causes all sorts of accidents. I have been, been so narrowly missed so many times. I've never been hit yet. We went to a, a bike shop not too long ago, and the young guy that was, uh, he's in downtown Austin where you, there are some places you can't ride on sidewalks. I ride on sidewalks where there are, when there are no bicycle lanes. You can't do that in downtown Austin. He got hit five times in one year, and, uh, and the last time put him in the hospital for quite, quite a while. But Parmer in 1431 is just one such dangerous uh, crossing area. There's a lot of them. You know what? Some of the more dangerous ones are just the ones when you're on a sidewalk. Like when I come up 1431 uh, going west to church and you got the HEB there, those drivers coming on that driveway, they are not looking for a bike on the sidewalk. And you've just got to watch it because very, very rarely does anybody go, I think I'll be nice and stop before I go to the cross. They usually go over the driveway 
block you so they can see the cars that they might have to stop for or they can get in front of. Happens all the time. Um, it just happened the other day, and I mean, I had to scream and yell to get the person to stop, and I'm not kidding, it was like, it was that narrow. Walton Way is another place that it happens to, because people who take a right there onto 1431, they're looking for the cars, and they just keep going. They don't stop at all. I, I give you those, those those ideas about that because it's so important to be as safe as you can. You can have all the bells and whistles and lights and all that on your bike that you want flags on a lower bike like that, um, but you still have to be very careful. I have been honked at by cars, screamed at by cars that believed I didn't have the right to be on the road slowing them down. All right, has that ever happened to any of you on a bike? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then there's always the semis and the pickups who just honk their horns really loud just to have some fun. That happens as, as well. Well, I, I have been, been blessed that that hasn't happened so much today, but a series of accidents does happen to people. I want you to take a look at this next video. This is a compilation of crosswalk accidents that have happened. Lord, I That was a cop that backed up into him. Yeah. There you go. See how dangerous it can be. That, that, that pick up there, it just absolutely knew I was coming. Knew I was coming and purposely just went there to block me off. I tell you what. And you know what's really, really, really strange about that particular situation is who was driving the pickup. You wouldn't believe who did that to me. I'm not kidding. Um, you'll see. I know we got it, unless he went up there and took it out. There you go. All right. So, you know... Um, so when those kinds of things happen, especially when someone you know does that to you, you want to know the kinds of things that are going through my mind? I can't tell you. I can't tell you. Um, but I'd let those drivers know if I didn't think some of them might be you, all right? Um, but let me just say, at the end of, of most of my bike rides, I got to spend a few moments um, in confession to God. And I just ask him, thank him for his safety, and then ask him to quiet my heart a little bit, because there are times when I just want to scream out. I just want to scream out and shout to God, God, why are you letting this happen? So when I was putting this message together about injustices in life, there was a scripture that, that came to mind from Habakkuk uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. This reminds me of, of me. Here is he seeing all the injustices in life going on against the Israelites from all of their enemies. They seem to be blessed by God, and he yells out, how long, Lord? Must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Have you ever wondered that? God, why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. Conflict is everywhere, and the law is paralyzed because justice never prevails. Now, on a personal note, I have to admit I have all kinds of what I call crosswalks in, in, in my life life. At least I see them that way. And I will admit that I've always been that way even from when I was a little kid. I tried hard not to be, but in reality, um, it's something I've, I've struggled with. When I was a kid, I had four sisters and one brother. I, my brother was older, and he always had friends over and stuff, and they would go out and play. Well, guess who wanted to tag along? Anybody there? Yeah, and he didn't want me to. Um, and it's like, you know, God, that's an injustice. I need another brother. 
because this one, well, anyway, um, in, in school, uh, most of my friends, they wanted to go out and play uh, uh, after school and so forth, and, uh, you know, mo- most of them were getting B's and C's in classes, which are fine, but I'd get home and my dad say, well, how'd you do today? I said, great, I got a 98% on the test. He'd go, how come you didn't get 100, go in your room and study? And I'm thinking, you know, that's not fair. That's, that's an injustice. And then I, I, I love cars, and I, and I, oh, I've had so many problems with cars. One, I think I've shared it before, I call it my sob story. It was a sob car, and it was, a, it was a great little car. It was a very used car. It was all I could afford. It was in my 20s. And um, on the test drive, the test drive, the water pump went out. You know, my first thought was, this is cool. I get a new water pump. You know, and then I'm also going to talk them into giving me a warranty. So they did. They gave me a new water pump. They gave me a warranty. They very clearly said we're going to cover the water pump and we're going to cover the engine and the engine block and things like that. So I thought that was that was pretty cool. It was it was like less than two weeks later the water pump went out again. The only problem with it this time was that it had destroyed the engine because it had heated up the engine block and cracked it. And I thought, well, no problem because I have a warranty that covers both the water pump and the engine block, only I didn't read the fine print. It said, but not if the water pump is the one that causes the damage to the engine block. You see the problem? That is an injustice. And then there was a sports car that we had. We used to drive it out in California down uh, 126 uh, through the orchards that were there. Now it's a bunch of houses, but we drive it to the ocean on Sunday afternoons. And we were going about 60 miles an hour when the right rear wheel literally flew off the car. Literally. I was dragging it, wondering what the heck happened, pulled over the side safely. A guy behind me pulls up and says, uh, did you know your wheel just flew about 50 yards into the orange grove? And so he went and got that. I called the, uh, the dealership, and I said, hey, you got to pick this car up. They sent out a flatbed. They found out two of the three other lug nuts were cracked. Uh, they tried to blame me, saying, well, you've been tightening them too tight. I says, I don't tighten them. You do. I bring it here to get it serviced. And, uh, and then I went to the owner of the company eventually and said, you know what? We need to just get our money back. We're, we're done with this. It was a very used car, and obviously it was a lemon, and they didn't want to take ownership of it, and I wanted to keep fighting it. And finally, the owner says, you know what? Let it go. Um, at least we're safe. Me, that was, I'm not over it yet. Because it was wrong. It was, it was an, an injustice. And, and you know, when I look at me personally and my pastoral counsel, I'm going to be real honest with you. Um, I'm supposed to listen when you come to me with your problems, and I really do my best. And I'm sorry when I don't, but I really, I really listen to you. But if, if it has something to do with an injustice, I'm coming up with a game plan. You know, I like, I want to fix it rather than just give you my love and give you my ear. And then when I read passages in Scripture, and I see that, that, that the prophet uh, Habakkuk, you know, he had the, kind of the same spirit that I did. I don't like injustices. But then when I read, like in Matthew 5, and this is Jesus talking, and he says, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil, resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. Isn't that exciting? And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. What most people focus on in this particular passage are the words of Jesus when he says, turn the other cheek. And my first response is, really, God? Just turn the, I'm just supposed to be a doormat. I'm just supposed to let other people walk all over me, and if they hurt me once, say, do it again, you know? And um, so what I did was I've done some studying on this, and, and a lot of times it's important when we look at Scripture is to look at the history of it too because we have to look at the context of the people. Where are they? How would they hear this? How would they understand this? Well, this is, this is written to people under Roman rule, and if we look at the context, there's two classes of people in the Roman culture. You have the haves and the haves not, have-nots. And part of the have culture were, were the Roman soldiers. If you're a Roman citizen and a Roman soldier, you got the power. Well, Roman soldiers were known to be right-handed because in those days, and maybe some of you experienced it in your days, if you were born to be left-handed, they would usually change it. Because that's not right. You've got to be right-handed. Well, so the soldiers are right-handed. That's the first place to understand. Now, when a, a soldier would get into an argument with somebody, maybe even fisticuffs, and this is with another citizen and equal, they would punch him. How would you punch? If you're right-handed, you'd probably throw a right. 
and you would hit the left cheek. All right? That's if this were an equal. When you're dealing with a person of the lower class, like a Christian peasant, they're not an equal. So you would show them contempt and disgust by slapping them across the cheek with your knuckles. That was how you would treat someone not your equal. So what Jesus is saying here is he's not saying you got to be a doormat. He's also not saying get even, right? What he's, he's saying here is when you get treated in this way, because it will happen in your life at some point in some time, turn to him your other cheek, your left cheek, because that's your way of saying, I may not be equal, you're equal in your eyes or in the eyes of the laws of this government, but I am your equal in the eyes of the Almighty God. Jesus just wanted them to know that it's okay. They're still right. They're right because of him. And they're right without being dead right. And what he's saying to them and to us today is find that balance. <laughs> he's saying that to me. In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 5, chapter 25, it reads, Better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Oh, that's not the right passage. I'm sorry. I, I don't even know why that's... I, it just happens to be one of my favorites. Anyway, we're going to move on here. It's actually Proverbs 25, verses 21 through 22, where it reads as follows. Uh, <laughs> if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Doesn't that sound good? To be able to heap burning coals on someone's head who you don't like because of how they've treated you, I don't think that's how God intends this to be understood. All right? I really don't. Though, though I know some of us are going, yeah, I, I, I loved it. What God is saying here is when someone does an injustice to you in your life, something that makes you want to get them back, to make it right, to get even, instead show them love. Show them an act of love. Demonstrate to that person the very last thing they would expect ever getting from you because it would be completely undeserved, so much like the love of Jesus Christ. Because what that will do is heap coals on their head. Now, what does that mean? In context, in those days, people who would be in repentance they would confess their sins to God. They would sit in ashes, and they would oftentimes pour ashes on their head, the coals on your head. And what Jesus is saying, or God is saying here in Proverbs, is acts of love from us to our enemies, to those who know they are undeserving of our love for them. When we show them love and kindness so undeserved, they are want, going to want to know why. Why would you do that? And that gives us an opportunity to point to Jesus Christ and to his love for us. When I was sharing this with Leona, she gave me a great illustration. Um, when she was a nurse, she had a nursing um, companion that wasn't a friend. In fact, I think they were kind of enemies. They didn't like each other very much. They didn't like to talk to each other. It was kind of like, like this. Until the other nurse's daughter came into the trauma center uh, from an accident, and she was pretty messed up. So Leona, knowing a lot of the doctors, went to the best surgeons and says, you need to get down there and help now. Not only did the girl's life get saved, but then she had another doctor who was good um, at, at, at fixing cosmetics, cosmetic surgery and, and fixed this girl like she was new. When Leona came out of the uh, the waiting room she or out of uh, where the girl was she came into the waiting room and there was the mother the enemy of Leona's and um, she must have known what Leona had done though Leona didn't say anything and she went over to her and hugged her and just started weeping and saying thank you thank you thank you and they became friends for life what I've discovered about that balance between being right and dead right is you can still be wronged and be right without being dead 
right? When you read the, best, the rest of the book of Habakkuk, God is saying, just wait, just wait, because justice is coming. It doesn't seem so at first, because in that first chapter, he says, you're not going to believe what you're going to see. I'm going to raise up your enemy, the Babylonians, and they are going to take over the land. They're going to take over everybody's possessions, everybody's housing. And you're thinking, what are you doing, God? But he goes on to say that, no, there is going to be justice. It is coming, but it is in my way and my time. God is saying, let him handle it. You know, God promises, as we talk about often here, to work all things that happen in our lives together for our good. I call those blessings. And that includes injustices in our life. And I just want to give you a, uh, some examples. This whole air conditioning episode that we had, we went for four days without air conditioning from the central air system. We only had to spend one night in, in, in hot temperatures because the next day after that, um, we had two people from this church, uh, three actually from this church, come over and bring some portable air conditioners for us so we could live in, um, in some coolness in our house until we got the air conditioning fixed. It gave me some time to process it and all that. And it just showed us the community, what it means to be, a com in, to be involved in a community of faith, a community of believers. Look to the people around you. Look to the people you're connected with in this church in your small groups. That's what this is about. We are to be show love and, and be family to each other. And that's what we got to experience. That was a real blessing. And something else I got to experience, completely unexpected. I had about 10 bids come in. Um, I was being pretty thorough. And um, two of the contractors I ended up praying with at our dining room table and over them because of things that came up in their lives. And it was just a result of conversation. One of the guys walked out and said, you know what, forget the bid. You can get it cheaper somewhere else. I already got paid what I need to get paid. I'm like, wow, I feel better about not going with you. But no, I mean, I, I didn't, but it was like, it was just so cool to be able to share um, my love of Jesus, you know, and, and how good he is. And of course, we ended up getting a, a, the, best, the best deal we could get on fixing our air and so I want to thank those people who are involved in that as well. When I go back to the cars I bought, the Saab with the water pump issue and the engine block, what a waste. And then that expensive sports car. I'll tell you what, with the wheel flying off, here, here, here's what I, I discovered. Um, don't be stupid when you buy things. You know, don't just do it because it's something you like. Um, be wise with the gifts that God has given you. Um, that's been a hard lesson for me, but I needed to learn it. And when people cut me off at, at, at crosswalks, I'm going to be real honest with you here. And Leona, you can vouch for this because you were sitting right there. It was, it was many months ago, but I did the same thing in my car, in the Jeep. I was in the Jeep. I drove right through a crosswalk so I could see what was going on. I cut off a cyclist because I wasn't paying attention to him. And he looked at me, and I went, you know, sorry which I'd seen so many times, um, and, uh, and, I, and I felt bad. But you know what? It came to my mind, who am I to judge others? Who knows what's going on in their lives? Who knows why those things happen? Don't take them so personal because they don't even know me, all right? It's better to be safe than be right when being right means being dead right. Now, not every injustice what I call an injustice in my life, um, have I found a satisfying answer to it. But when I do struggle with them, I do find that it helps to look up here at the cross. Because when I see Jesus on the cross, there is no greater injustice. There's none. <laughs> what did he do to deserve that? He's the only one of all humanity who could live the perfect life who could be completely obedient to his father's will. And yet he was put to death for that. That's an injustice. But you know, as I, as I think about that, had he not allowed that to happen, because he could have. He could have said no. He could have walked down from that cross, right? If he had not paid with his life the penalty for our sin, because the penalty is death, right, the wages of sin is death, then we would have had to pay it ourselves. Ah, oh, then we'd be right. But we'd be dead right. And we would never be able to spend eternity with him. Jesus 
found that balance for us. And when I think about the injustices in, in life, it helps me to think of Jesus on that cross looking down at these people who are <laughs> screaming at him, mocking him, killing him. And yet, it's almost when he says these words, it's like he's, he's, he's cutting them off at their crosswalk. Because that's, he's their crosswalk for some reason. Right then and right there, they have it out for him. And he looks down at them, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He found that balance between being right and dead right for us. That's what he did. When we trust in Jesus as our Savior, he takes that greatest injustice of all time and he turns it into the greatest blessing of all time for those he loves forgiveness he gives us an eternal life that promise that's through his death but his resurrection gives us the victory over death itself and the certain hope that we've been singing about all morning about spending eternity with the Lord. He turns all the injustices of life, all those times when Christians then and Christians now are backhanded in disrespect, in contempt, and all those times I've been cut off at crosswalks, you, the same, he takes it all and he gives us the means to say, thank you you, Jesus, for taking care of it all for us. In the crosswalks of your life, of your life, whatever they may be, we all have them. Whatever they are, know that in Jesus, you've been made right without having to be dead right. Literally, that's what he did for you and me. And we say thank you, Jesus.